Good afternoon and good morning. Um, welcome to the Code for Life webcast around the future of healthcare. Uh, my name is Kieran Burkett. I'm the Global Digital Manager in Talent Marketing um, and responsible for the Code for Life program. Um, at Rush, uh, we're leveraging various technologies to really help solve complex challenges within healthcare. Um, the Code for Life initiatives and, and the reason why we're hosting this webcast really helps us showcase to the world how we are leveraging these technologies to improve the lives of patients around the world. Um, our Code for Life initiatives um, enable us to really um, bring, bring the technologies and the challenges home um, and the way that we can impact healthcare. So visiting the Code for Life webcast will really help, uh, website will really help you understand you know, what we're doing in healthcare, how the technologies um, are leveraged. Um, so please feel free to take a look. Um, as part of the program, we offer um, various types of hackathons, um, different engagements across social media. So please feel free to visit the website, codeforlife.rush.com. Uh, and yeah, ask us some questions over social media. Uh, over the next hour, um, we'll take you on a tour of how we're leveraging and revolutionizing healthcare, leveraging data and AI. Um, so in saying that, I'd like to hand over to Bryn Roberts. Thanks, Karen. So welcome everybody. It's a great pleasure to, uh, uh, to introduce to you the first topic. So I'm gonna to touch on big data and artificial intelligence and, and how we apply these and use these in, within pharma R&D. So before that, I'll just briefly introduce myself um, so you know who I am. So I have a background in pharmacology, uh, PhD and, and bachelor's in pharmacology. And I've been in the industry for a number of years doing a variety of roles, uh, but in more recent times, focusing more and more on data science, on informatics around R&D. I joined Roche in 2006 as the global head of uh, scientific method and algorithm development. So kind of data science, if you like, and as the site head of research informatics here. And now, uh, a few years later, I'm the Global Head of Operations for Pharma Research and Early Development, and Informatics is part of that department. And you see here a beautiful little picture of the Roche Basel campus, as it will be in a few years' time. So outside of Roche, I'm a visiting fellow at Oxford University, where I have a variety of different activities um, on the Board of Directors and the Advisory Board for Pastoral Alliance, and, and some other things like uh, scientific advisory boards for um, the Institute of uh, Systems Biology, Computational Biology and Systems Biology. So that's me in a nutshell, uh, now really to the topic. So introducing AI and its application in, in life science. So first of all, maybe we talk a little bit about some things you saw alluded to in the video there. We're in this period at Roche where we're focusing on personalized healthcare. So moving from this traditional approach of one medicine fits all symptoms, a syndromic based approach on the left here, to a much more precise uh, approach, understanding patients um, at different levels of biology, which I'll come on to, and then having the right medicine for the right patient at the right time. So this is really behind a lot of the examples you'll hear this afternoon or this morning, depending where you're dialing in from. So one of the things that's really transforming the world for us is the digitization of science and medicine. So we see here an example, a diagram of biology at different scales from the molecular level with DNA and RNA up through proteins to whole cells and organs, a whole organism, body, to populations of people. And there's important data being generated at all of these different biological scales, from genomics and proteomics and various types of imaging and human behavior, right through to real-world real world healthcare data from uh, when we visit the hospitals and, and our general practitioners. And we'll talk about data from different parts of this uh, scale as we go through. And it really is, from a data perspective, an unprecedented time. We have available to us data now at a scale and a richness that we have never dreamt of, actually, in the past. So from genomic sequencing data, as I mentioned, real-world data, and often those things are coupled. And you'll see examples of how we use those later. Um, data from wearables and sensors, which we'll talk about as well, um, through various imaging uh, modalities and, and various other cytometry and so forth. And one of the key aspects of data to make it usable for us is the data need to be fair. We're not going to talk a lot about fair today, but I just wanted to make sure that this was mentioned. And we may come back to it in the Q&A. So we have to have data which is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And maybe just to sort of build on that, we often think about big data as the, uh, on these four dimensions, the four Vs of big data. Our volume is pretty obvious. There's a lot of it. Uh, velocity, so often data are being generated or need to be analyzed at a high rate, high speed. Data are coming from a variety of different sources and different data types, as you saw on the previous slide. 
And then this veracity, how trustworthy are these data? What's the quality of these data? Um, how generalizable are the data for my purpose? And thinking about big data, there are two broad areas of challenge for us. Uh, one is very technical about how do we store all these data? How do we move these data around? How do we compute over very large data sets? So a very technical sort of IT, if you like, set of challenges. And largely those are well covered for us, relatively, in a sense, conceptually straightforward. The variety and veracity brings a different class of challenge, which are more scientifically based. So, you know, how do we use these data for purposes for which they were never generated? So that's the example of real world data when we use it for R&D, for example. Uh, data standards, curation, quality control, these kind of things. And we'll touch on those as we go through. So big data really uh, represent a huge opportunity for us, but also some challenges in this space. So back to our model. So we talked about digitization, so data being available in digital form as opposed to, for example, paper form. Uh, now digitalization, as we have those data integrated, how do, we, how do we utilize them? How do we bring them together? Perhaps we add as well the literature and additional experiments from our labs and so forth. And this is the point where we're going to talk about artificial intelligence. And what do we mean by artificial intelligence? Uh, we're not talking here about robots who are completely autonomous and human-like. Uh, we're really focusing in on, on, a, on a narrow field of AI, which is largely based around machine learning and a subset of machine learning, which is deep learning. And we'll see examples of this uh, this afternoon. What we're not gonna really touch on in a great deal is more general AI, where we have all of these other um, aspects of human computer interaction, cognition, emotion. Um, these are very important across the AI industry space, but for us in pharma research and, and development, um, they're, they're niches. We do use them from time to time, but we're going to focus very much on deep and machine learning today. So thinking about just an introduction to machine learning and deep learning, uh, I know many of you on the call are probably pretty familiar with this, but there'll be one or two maybe who are less, less so. Uh, if I put up these two images, we can all immediately say what type of animal these two are, the two are and we can distinguish them clearly. Um, now, for a computer, that's a much more difficult challenge. We've learned somehow the difference between a dog and a cat, and it's very hard for us to describe the heuristics. What exactly are we doing when we discriminate between these two, two animals? So the first way we can enable a machine to do this kind of discrimination or classification is to do a symbolic approach. So we would take features from these images, like the shapes of the ears, the size of the eyes, the shapes of the eyes, these kind of things and represent them into a computable form. So certain types of strings or vectors or matrices, depending on the, on the features that we're extracting. We can then train with, with many of these data, of course. We can then train a classifier. And in this case, something like a decision tree, like a random forest classifier. And build rules that enable the machine to determine, yes, based on this, these features and these characteristics, it's a dog or it's a cat. And we use this approach uh, extensively, and I'll show a couple of examples. The advantages are we can select the features for known relevance. So particularly for scientific data, we may have prior knowledge. So we can point the computer in the right direction, if you like. And the rules are pretty transparent because we've defined the features in this particular example. <clears throat> Downside is there's an awful lot more information in the images that we ignore, essentially. So um, we're very limited by the set of features that we select or we guide the machine towards. Now, an alternative approach, which we're going to call deep learning here, is actually not to tell the computer anything about the features of the image up front, and actually to put the basic uh, raw data into the machine. So at the pixel level, we pump it in, and then we train the machine uh, deep neural network in a similar way that we have learned to tell the difference between dogs and cats as we've developed and our brains have, have learned uh, the differences. So I won't go into a lot of details about the architecture. We will touch on it again later, but we have a, a, a deep multi-layer neural network architecture here where there's a series of convolutional um, activities and rectification activities to eventually build the classifier, which can then again, like the first example, tell the difference that this is a dog and not a cat. Now, the advantage of this type of model is we don't need to specify the features up front, so we can actually discover features in data which we didn't know existed. In principle, it uses all the information encoded in the data. 
and um, we can use transfer learning. So we can build these models that can tell a dog from a cat and we can then actually use that as the starting point for a classifier maybe that can tell a cancer cell from a normal cell and we'll show examples of that. The downside is these really do require large volumes of data to, to get a good outcome. Um, the, the rules within the network are not easily readable from a human form, although there are, there are ways, we'll look at that a little bit, um, where we can look at the rules. And it also may learn to discriminate based on irrelevant features, and we may not fully understand what it's doing. So, you know, there's, there are questions about how do you validate these models. An example of that is if you search in Google for reindeer, you'll see images such as this. And if you search for red deer, you'll see images like this. Now, clearly the animals are different, but you see also the types of environments in which they're photographed are also typically different. So one risk with these types of classifiers is you may classify the animal based on the background colors and, and the background. And uh, such an example is here. So this is a fallow deer and uh, it appeared as a reindeer in the, in the search I did, partly because it was on a snowy background. There were also some metadata um, that were incorrect actually as I looked into it. So the, the, the heads up here is be very careful what your machine is learning from. So that's a basic introduction to big data and machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence in, a, in, in general. And now let's look at a couple of examples um, from our labs. So the first, first example is where we want to understand um, the mechanism of action of novel antibiotic drugs. So we're trying to find molecules that have a novel uh, uh, mechanism to kill bacteria. So we put bacteria into some um, little wells on plates and we stain them in different ways with fluorescent stains. And we build up what we call a phenotypic fingerprint. So many different features and characteristics of these cells, which we can then read on, an, on a fluorescence imager. And in the same way as we looked at with the dog and cat, um, we use a symbolic approach here. So we have a number of features which we have identified. We can make those computable, computable as fingerprints, put them through a classifier. In this case, again, the random forest classifier. And then we get a multi-class prediction of the mechanism of novel molecules based on what we've trained the model from known antibiotic mechanisms. So you see the star diagram. These are different classes of antibiotic that we know um, and have trained the machine on. And now it can classify the unknown molecules that we're testing into the different classes. And what we're particularly looking for here are molecules that don't fit directly into a, an existing class. So they would potentially be novel and not be subject to the same resistance mechanisms of existing antibiotics. And here our random forest classifier is actually very powerful and uh, is now in, in full production and is able to test yeah, many thousands of compounds uh, per screen. Second example, some of our drugs or many of our drugs are based on uh, proteins such as antibodies. This is the structure of an antibody with its two arms which capture onto the, the target of interest. So this area here, the binding domain, is particularly critical for the way that the antibody interacts with the target. So if it's trying to, for example, capture a, uh, a cancer cell, and perhaps link it to a, an immune cell to kill it, it's very important that we get that binding site correct. And that's very dependent on the angles of these different protein units um, and the orientation. Now, as we engineer these molecules, we change different um, residues in this overall protein mo molecule and sometimes that can disturb the angles here and we lose the binding of the of the drug candidate. So we developed a, a model which would enable us to predict um, structural changes uh, or let's say predict what the structural changes will do to these angles. So based on data that we took from the public domain, so crystal structures as well as the sequences of the antibodies as well as our own internal data we looked at these different angles and, and lengths. So this particular model is classified based on five angles and a, and, a, and, a, and a length. Again, we used a random forest classifier. You'll hear this theme over and over. It's a very powerful method. And we have a really a best in class classifier um, within Roche that outperforms all the other published methods that we were aware of at the time. And we've incorporated that in our antibody engineering workflow in large molecule research. So we automate um, the selection of molecules based on this amongst other parameters. But this is very important that we don't waste too much resource on molecules that are gonna, uh, not going to bind effectively. 
And then my last example is um, looking at a clinical data set, an image-based data set, where we take retinal images, so pictures of the back of the eye, and we're trying to understand the effects of diabetes on the thickness of the retina. So it's called diabetic macular thickening. So the retina actually gets thicker as a result of the disease and causes um, issues with vision. And this is a very interesting example of deep learning because we took a model which was originally based on an image net classifier. So something that can classify general images like dogs and cats, which was then refined. So we had this transfer um, learning or transfer of knowledge step when the model was optimized um, in, in a Kaggle diabetic retinopathy challenge, which was a public challenge. And then we've taken that a step further by putting our phase, a number of phase three clinical studies in from, from Roche, um, uh, from our own clinical trials to produce a sort of a, an enhanced model. And uh, this model can classify um, different types of thickness of the retina based just on these 2D images uh, with different cutoffs. And what I mentioned earlier is it's very difficult to understand what features exactly is this model drawing from the image to, to make that classification. It's a, I should say, it's a very good classifier. So the area under the rock curve, 0.97, so it's a quite uh, a, a very high performing uh, uh, classifier. So to understand what features in the image or what areas of the image the uh, network was using to weight its predictions, uh, we use a, uh, an approach called attribution maps. So using a, a, a sort of a back propagation of the neural network we can understand which areas of the images the classifier was weighting most highly um, in the model. And you see on the right-hand side here in the black and white images, marked in red, the areas where the machine was focusing. And if you look at the original color funnel images on the, on the left, they correlate with areas of edema, so um, leakage where we have um, fluid building up in the retina and around blood vessels, which are obviously where much of the leakage is coming from. So that's a way of understanding, if you like, the, um, the way that the machine has learnt about these images. So with that, I'm gonna just summarize. So we talked, we started by thinking about personalized healthcare and we really have this cycle. So we have meaningful data at scale, these big data. We apply advanced analytics such as machine and deep learning. And from that, we can do smarter and more efficient R&D. So you, I gave a couple of examples of how we've optimized within our R&D processes in the labs. But also, and you'll hear from um, Florian and Anna in a, in a moment, a little bit more about what that means for, um, for patients actually in the clinic. And then as we get data from the clinic, so-called real-world data or clinical trial data, these feed back and create more meaningful data at scale. So this is a, a virtuous cycle of data being used to drive uh, better experiments, which creates more data and so on. So I hope from that brief introduction, you've understood that artificial intelligence, machine and deep learning are providing increasingly valuable insights for us in various different areas of, of medicines, research and development. The methods do need to be selected carefully and optimized for each use case. Uh, but this example of transfer learning means we can take models from different domains uh, to give us a quick start in a, in a new domain. Uh, digitization and digitalization in, in medicine and in R&D are creating these big data assets. And often these cannot be fully exploited without these AI type of uh, techniques. Ultimately, and this I hope this is if you take nothing home from this bit, high quality data are key and they need to be fair as we discussed at the beginning. And what I didn't really talk about is data science as a capability is essential. So both Florian and, and Anna are, are data scientists, you'll hear from in a moment. And without people with the appropriate skills, um, all of these techniques are very, very difficult to apply. So actually having these um, really talented people, talented data science capability uh, available to us is absolutely critical for us to leverage the big data and to make uh, these kind of benefits for patients. And with that, I just want to acknowledge uh, so many of our colleagues have contributed to these examples and external collaborators. So uh, I'm sure that's going to be true of all the examples we'll see later. But with that, I'm very happy to hand over to Florian. Yeah, so um, thanks very much, Bryn. I really appreciate that. Um, on the topic around PHC, we have a wonderful video just to give a bit of a, uh, a view of what PHC really is and what it means for us.
Would you kindly play the video? Imagine a world where every patient had the best possible care. Care that was tailored to them, to their individual disease, to their individual lifestyle. Modern biology teaches us that if you look closely, each patient in every disease is unique. We imagine a world where we can harness this knowledge so that every patient receives exactly the treatment they need. Advances in data, analytics, and digital technologies promise to enable this through the biggest shift in healthcare we have ever known. A shift that brings into focus each individual and their unique data profile that reflects their health or illness. This future, where every patient has the best possible support, will be a world that we call personalized healthcare. Already, by bringing together targeted treatments and diagnostics, we can identify patients who will benefit more from certain medicines than others. But we now have the opportunity to go even further, harnessing crucial data that no one has been able to capture so far. This is changing, though, and it all starts with what we call meaningful data at scale. Today, researchers are selecting unprecedented amounts of meaningful data, high-quality data focused on answering key scientific questions, gathered across enough patients to yield conclusions that are generally applicable. And it's not just data from clinical trials, but also real-world data, like genetic profiles of individuals and their diseases. Data from a wide range of imaging technologies, from wearable devices, and from patients undergoing care around the world. Our ability to understand, analyze, and interpret this vast volume of data is allowing a higher resolution view of each individual patient, enabling us to understand how people live with disease and their treatment to inspire future innovations. But harnessing and analyzing the data isn't enough. We must take a holistic approach to adapt the entire healthcare system to better support personalized healthcare. And we know we can't do it alone. That's why we're working with patients, physicians, governments, insurers, and regulators. Our goal is smarter and more efficient drug research and development, improved patient access, and truly personalized care. We bring a unique combination of strengths to the table. Deep scientific expertise, a broad footprint across pharmaceuticals and diagnostics, and a lasting commitment to the patient. It won't be easy, but that has never stopped us before. The result will be worth it. A more sustainable health care for the world and the best possible care for every patient. This is personalized health care. This is Roche. All right. So hello, everyone. It is my pleasure now to speak a little bit about what we here in Roche do with digital biomarker data, how we analyze it and how we leverage deep learning technology to actually make more sense of this huge amount of data now being collected in our clinical trials or observational studies. But um, before I dig into that, um, just a little bit about myself. So um, I did uh, studies in bioinformatics and biomathematics and my PhD in bio biomathematics at Bielefeld uh, University in Germany and uh, actually afterwards I immediately moved to Roche and I think um, from from basically my flow my flow through the Roche organization a little bit um, and how this changed you already see that Roche is a quite flexible and agile um, environment you can do a lot of different data analysis actually one of the examples uh, Bryn showed in his slide deck um, about the antibody prediction. It's actually something I did when I was still uh, working in our Russian Innovation Center in Munich. Nowadays, I'm here in Basel and uh, working on digital biomarker data. So quite some different types of data, um, which is actually, I think, a great opportunity to have in a company like um, Roche, where um, there are really different types of data coming in, different types of questions coming in, and um, yeah, and everyone is looking for the right people with the right expertise. So let's dig into analyzing digital biomarker data. So first of all, maybe very quickly, why do we, what do we mean with digital biomarkers, and why do we actually do it? And for us, everything starts with a patient and with the life of a patient. So what you see here is 365 days of a year of a patient which 
might have some chronic symptoms, maybe Parkinson's disease, maybe something else. And actually how this year looks like for a patient is exemplified in this slide. So you see that there are good days, there are bad days, and there are clinical visits or visits with the physician. And um, that's where you see where the problem is actually coming in. So you see that there's this huge variability in how the disease might um, progress in the daily life of the patient, but you just get snapshots of that data when the, when the patients are actually seeing a physician. And of course they can tell you about how their disease looks like, but every one of us uh, knows, I guess, how difficult that is, how difficult it is to remember what I had as food for five days ago. So that's the same, obviously, also with disease. If there's not a really crucial event, then it's really hard for us to tell about how the disease is evolving over time. And that's where we try to make a difference with um, levering, leveraging now mobile sensor technologies. So usually um, consumer grade technologies, things like smartphones or wearables, which are very well equipped with different types of sensors like um, gyroscopes and accelerometers. You, of, co of course, have sound, you might have GPS, you might have touch data, different other things. And what you can do with that data is actually you can collect that data from patients in different types of ways and then use algorithms and data analysis to actually identify suitable information in this um, streamed sensor data and combine it then with standard clinical data to actually gain more clinical knowledge about every given patient. And that's what I try to exemplify now a little bit of with the examples I will show now. So what we roughly do here is we can usually distinguish two different types of scenarios with digital biomarker data. One is what we call active tests. So where we ask patients to do certain things via, for example, a smartphone app. And the other thing is what we call passive monitoring, where we just collect passively the sensor data. If you wear, for example, a wearable or your smartphone, you um, all the time produce this type of sensor data and we leverage that sensor data to learn more about your disease, your disease in daily life. So what you will see as examples is um, one thing which, is, which was more a kind of exploratory project um, where we tried to find out if we can improve our active tests by um, actually showing gaze patterns, so following where people are looking on the screen because that might be relevant for a disease. For the passive monitoring scenario, we will talk about how can we actually leverage this passive monitoring data because we have no labels, we don't know what these people are actually doing. So let's start with um, the investigation of gaze tracking using deep learning. So that's actually um, a project which we did together with a student from um, our collaboration with Oxford University. So we have a great collaboration there, which is actually organized by Brin, um, which enables us to work together with uh, PhD students there and um, work on projects which are of relevance for academia as well as companies like Roche. And um, so what we did there is um, in, in that project, we evaluated actually an existing solution from the ac academic world around um, gaze tracking with smartphones um, for our purposes. So we, it's a deep learning solution, which was pre-trained. And um, of course, one part of the project was actually making it usable in our environment, because as you know, that's not always that intuitive. So um, one of the outcomes of this project is now um, basically new GitHub code, which we share um, so that everyone has an easier life to actually try what we tried out. Um, the other thing what um, that we did there is we tried different types of scenarios to actually make it interesting for us. So in, in this typical example, it was about, okay, can we identify if people are looking on a screen and there is a face there. Where are people actually looking? Are they looking more to the eye or are they looking more to the mouth? Because there are diseases like autism um, where this might make a difference and information about where they are predominantly looking might, may, might be very interesting. And we also looked into time trajectories by just letting people um, follow a circle and see if we could uh, follow that uh, with, our, with the algorithms. And what we found out is 
this is a solution, but it's not the best solution at the moment. So um, that's a great thing about, um, I think, also the stage where we are in. I think there are a lot of quite okay solutions already out there for many different problems, but there are also a lot of room of improvement where people can step in and actually make a difference in the future. And I think that's one of the cases here. So this can certainly, so this publicly available solution can certainly be improved in many different types of ways. Um, we made a small contribution by actually showing that um, there are better ways to um, to correct for certain errors in there. Um, but yeah, I think that's just a good example. And we are, have now, um, we are now accepted for publication. So let's move briefly into the other area of passive monitoring. So I will have two very quick examples there. One is about Parkinson's disease. So that's the first trial where we used digital biomarkers actually. And um, so what we did there is for active tests, we collected basically that's annotated data. So we know that people are walking, standing, um, saying ah or tapping a screen. So that's roughly 40 gigabytes of data. But then we had also this 1.2 terabytes of data where we just didn't know what people were doing. So we needed to get a way around that we need this information of what people are actually doing to be able to use dedicated algorithms to identify if there is a problem with what they are doing in the disease. And what we used there is, again, we went back to academia and um, there is something which is called human activity recognition and there are different ways to do that. One very popular one is obviously nowadays a convolutional recurrent neural network. And that's something which we adapted and um, retrained basically with data which were of relevance for us. And um, then the two types of validation steps. So we left out obviously one part of the data to validate it with that data. But the nice thing about our data set is actually that we have all this annotated active test data where we know what people are doing. So what we could also do is we could also validate it on our own data and we could show that um, this is not only working for data coming from the public domain where people might not have Parkinson's disease, but it's also working for, um, for my deep disease Parkinson's disease patients. And what we can then do with this type of data is, of course, we can make inferences about what is going on in these different activities. And very simple examples for that are actually um, just looking about how much do these people actually walk in daily life. And you can imagine that that's very important for these people. And you see that there is a big difference between healthy older people and Parkinson's disease people of the same age. You can also see that the people are impaired in sitting down or standing up. So they try to circumvent these type of problems in daily life, which of course has also a great impact on how they function in daily life. And they also are much slower in actually turning in daily life. So they everything is up just more difficult for them. And that's important information for us as a company to, to know, of course, because if you develop a drug and you can show that these type of symptoms don't progress that much, and that's a great, that's, that's great for us and it's even greater for a patient. So let's move into a totally different field, which is schizophrenia, and let's look to the other part of the data. So we have spoken about mobility. But actually, what is also interesting is if you take the watch and you look into the in, into the information of basically non-mobility, if one would say that. So we are looking here for negative symptoms, looking for signs of apathy, for not being very expressive in speech or emotions, and how this might be aligned to um, actually data which we get from a variable. So what we have there is um, a simple variable with accelerometer data. And um, we, we had um, 30 weeks, 30 weeks um, where we collected this data, uh, a lot of data again. And again, we applied our, our solution, our deep learning solution. And now we focused more on the periods where people were not walking, because what we want to look in is actually how are they using gestures? Because that's a sign of ex ex expressivity and that's something which might be related to negative symptoms. And what we could show is, first of all, there was a clinical test where they were asked to do a certain test and um, you could see how willing are they to do a certain tasks. 
And you can see that actually their willingness to do that task was correlated with um, actually how active these people are, which is interesting. But the other very interesting found is actually that um, this notion of people having less expression and being less um, yeah, involved in their environment, taking part in that, is actually um, correlated to how engaged people are in, for example, talking and showing their hands and doing gestures like we are doing, like I'm doing here just now. And um, so I think that's a very interesting and great um, finding, which just shows you um, with the right type of idea and the right type of question and the right type of model used, you can identify a whole lot of different things from um, a whole lot of data you collect in, for example, clinical trials. So as a take-home method, message, basically, we are able to use this technology in various types of ways to actually continuously monitor patients, see day-to-day -day varia uh, variations. We can use deep learning to make, make much more sense of that, for example, to unlock gaze patterns with smartphone cameras in the right environment. You can use the raw sensor data to infer daily activities and align that with things like mobility or gesture features. And I think a taken home message is that um, we need a lot of technical savvy talent for actually making that happen. Actually, just <laughs> one quick word about that. So our department is uh, very active at the moment in hiring um, as well internal positions as well um, as contractor positions. So if anyone in the webcast might be interested or knows people who are interested in joining us, we are very open and looking for talent there. So please um, apply or just write me an email. And that's it. And it's now my pleasure to um, take over, give, give the key to Anna Baumir. Okay, thank you, Florian. Um, so yeah, my, it's my pleasure now to talk a little bit about where we use deep learning again, a little bit in the R&D processes. We have seen one example earlier and I have another one. Um, and I will talk about how we use deep learning on these real world data that we also heard about. So let me start also by introducing myself a little bit. I grew up in the beautiful city of Munich, studied bioinformatics there at both universities there, and then actually did my PhD in another extremely beautiful city, uh, Barcelona in Spain, which is nice because it's close to the sea. And the building you see on that picture is actually where I work, used to work. Extremely nice for lunch breaks, you can imagine. So my, my research there was basically on doing something that's called systems biology, so really trying to build mathematical models to explain biological phenomena and, and systems. And I did a lot of research there on network, um, yeah, networks, and basically was already then trying to integrate information from patients coming from these electronic health record data into these models. When I then went to uh, Stanford School of Medicine, where I did my postdoc in biomedical informatics, I was then really focusing on these type of data. So really, we had access to the electronic health record information of patients at the uh, Stanford Hospital. And then we used also these kind of deep, uh, it wasn't deep learning back then, but it was AI technologies to basically extract information. So when I then joined Roche, in 2013, I went basically back to Munich. So now I'm heading the data science team in the Roche Innovation Center Munich. Also beautiful because it's actually close to the Alps. And so again, great place to live and work. So let me now go into the first example. So this is um, going back to where we use deep learning for process optimization. And here this example is very concretely on where we want to improve monoclonality detection in our large molecule research cell line development. And when you think of uh, cell line development, we need these cell lines because they actually produce the antibody, the therapeutic antibody we want to bring to the patients in the end. And these antibodies, of course, we need them to be of high quality. They need to be high st high stable, highly stable. We need to, to get a lot out of that. And also we need to produce them in these monoclonal cell lines. That's even a requirement by the regulatory authorities. So they really ask us to prove that these cell lines are monoclonal. And we can do that in several ways. One is actually doing that in a more statistical approach, which we also do. But then there is another way where we can actually use imaging technology. And so what has happened over the past is that 
the Cell and Development Department actually went through this digital transformation of the labs. So what is really happening is that we automate as much as we can of these processes to, to enable more high throughput, of course. And so what we have, basically, you see that here, that's a picture of the lab, robotic pipetting, cell culture and imaging. And now we have this imaging in place where basically, sorry, um, where we can now take images of, of so at certain times and then basically look at these images and then tell via image analysis whether we have a monoclonal or multiclonal. And even the proprietary imager that we bought uh, brings a software that can do that. The only problem with the software is that it has actually a quite high false positive rate, which means that in many cases it tells us, yes, this is monoclonal. We think we can continue with this line, but then after actually manual reassessment, assessment, we realize, mm, not monoclonal, and we have to throw it away. This process, because of the manual step, is time-consuming, te tedious, and not great. So what we thought is, can't we reduce the manual workload and bias, decrease time to results, and basically improve monoclonality detection by using deep learning? And that's exactly what we did. So this is the data description that we are looking at. So we have these images at different resolutions. Um, sorry. And here is, you can see actually what they can look like. These are easy examples. We have different channels, channels as well. We have then a multi-channel on the bottom. And you see the easy cases, I can tell you that which is monoclonal, which is multiclonal. But the difficult ones is even for experts sometimes quite difficult to assess. Um, so, but we, what we can do is we can use these convolutional neural networks that work particularly well on imaging data to do that better. And what we did here is also a concept that Bryn explained earlier, the transfer learning. So we basically took architectures from outside. Maybe some of you have heard of ResNet, Inception, V3, etc. Um, and we also created our own one, by the way, and then compared performance. So the data we had as input was from the imager, 60,000 images with the labels from the imagers, imaging software. Problem was that we had to cope with a high class imbalance because the whole process is actually designed so that we end up with monoclonal cell line. So per se, because of the process, we will have many more monoclonal labels than multiclonal. But it's always a problem if you have too high imbalance, then the training is kind of more difficult. We have this high label noise because of the high false positive rate. So what we also did in addition, we handpicked 6,000 images with manual labels, got a better uh, dis so balance basically, and then we used that also. Here's now the results. So here I only show the results of two of the architectures because the others actually didn't, did not perform that well. And what we are focusing here on is really the sensitivity because we really want to get rid of these false positives. And what we could achieve with our deep learning is basically to detect more than 80% of the true multiclonal cells, which were falsely classified as monoclonal by the imager. And that's what we really want to reduce. So we're quite happy with these results because this actually meant reducing the false positive rate from approximately 17% now to only 3% and therefore drastically reducing the manual work needed. So to summarize this first example, we are really going through a digital transformation, which also means that we are automating many of the processes and therefore generating these large data on which we can then apply our, for example, machine learning or deep learning um, methods. This requirement of, ha of having these monoclonal cell lines is, is a given, so we really have to work on that. We had the problem with this high false positive rate and could really improve this by implementing the convolutional neural network here. And this one of them, which I showed, is now really built into the workflow and is now really part of the, of the whole process. So now I want to move on to showing you something on what we do with this so-called real-world data, and that we also can use deep learning on those data. But let me start with explaining a little bit what real-world data is. So real-world data, and you see it on the right, basically refers to many sources that contain information about patients and their outcomes but in the real world setting. So not in a controlled clinical trial, but as it actually happens in the, in the real world where they are treated in a hospital, for example. And one of, the, um, one of these resources is the electronic health records. So really that what is captured in a hospital. And Roche acquired 
uh, Flat Iron Health, which is the most advanced real world evidence platform in oncology. And I have now examples on how we can leverage these data. So here is basically, and I won't, don't, won't go into all the details, but here is basically, it shows you all the different um, points where we can actually use real world data to create values for our PRED project teams. And so it, it starts with actually, uh, for example, you want to select the right site from which you want to recruit the patient. That could be one. You At some point, you need to know which patient population you want to look into. And here, for example, we need to define so-called inclusion and exclusion criteria for our clinical studies. So just to explain it very briefly, pregnant women usually are always excluded from clinical trials. And so that's an easy one. But then there are, of course, other ones. And looking into the real world data can help us here. Um, other examples are then later on where we are in the in the trial already, we give the drug to the patients, but now we actually want to interpret these data. And by looking into the real world again, we can help the teams to better understand what they see in the trial. So now looking at these um, flat iron data again, you see here on the left now what flat iron health really provides. So basically that's a, that's a flat iron provider network where it's about 2 million active cancer patients in the network, 265 cancer clinics that are participating. And what flat iron really does is they take these electronic health records and that's on the lower part. We see here there is a structured uh, piece in these, in these data, which is for example, information on the diagnosis, on the visits, when they came in to the hospital, on the demographic information, etc. But there's also a pretty large unstructured piece, which is basically free textual notes that the physicians, the doctors take. So there's pathology reports, radiology reports, discharge notes, etc. But quite rich information sitting in there. So Flatiron, they actually go in there, also using uh, machine learning technology, by the way. But on top of that, they have a huge manual a quality check basically. So what they then provide us with is this integrated real world evidence data space where you can really talk of fair data basically. It's high quality, it's accessible, findable, reusable, etc. And what we then do in data science, we can, we can access these data, do a lot of data crunching and analysis, and then for example, help the, stu the study teams to define these inclusion exclusion criteria. And one example I brought is coming from the cancer immunotherapy where basically in cancer immunotherapy, we try to develop drugs that kind of boost the immune system, help uh, fight the cancer, kind of. And because of that, it's kind of well known that you many patients will experience so-called immune-related adverse events to these drugs because the immune system is active. Actually, for many of those, it's related to a good outcome, good treatment outcome, because the immune system is active. However, there is, of course, a discussion whether you should then, for example, include patients that have a history of autoimmune disorder, so also something going on with the immune system, into our cancer immunotherapy trials. And to kind of look at these patients, you can go now to something like flat iron, take a look how many are there, and then actually uh, compute this risk from the real world data, and therefore inform the study team in whether to keep it as inclusion criteria or not. The next example I have is kind of like the holy grail we're kind of working towards at the moment. So in a clinical study, we typically compare a drug to a, a placebo or maybe a standard care in, in the later phases, at least. In the earlier phases, we typically do not compare to anybody. It's so-called single arm. So problem is, if you come to a clinical study as a patient, then... Um, you don't even know whether you, uh, you'll be assigned to the drug or the placebo because it has to be randomized. But imagine you're this patient and you want to get access to this new potentially helpful drug and you don't get it. It's kind of dramatic, right? So imagine we could now, instead of having these control arms, we could replace them by the real world. That would be fantastic for the patients. It would also, of course, speed up our development. And also, just to mention, in, in some of the cancer immunotherapy trials, it's even very, very difficult to recruit those patients that are needed because there are simply not that many out there because we are going more and more personalized, so it's going to be more and smaller and smaller patient populations we're looking into. And this is now really exciting work of colleagues where they could show that, and, and this is actually a so-called Kaplan-Meier 
uh, curve. So it's a survival analysis where you basically look at survival of, of patients. And we see here the upper one is uh, the Alectinib, Alexenza drug, that's a Roche drug. That was, this is data from a phase two um, a single arm trial. So that's our internal data. But the lower one, the lower curve is actually from the standard care drug from the constructed from the real world. And so basically when this was shown, um, it helped basically to expand the access of Alexander in more than 20 countries by one year earlier than anticipated. So patients could really benefit one year earlier from this novel drug, which helps certain subtype in this cancer type. Um, and this is of course great. And now we're really working towards having more and more of these examples. And why am, why am I telling you all that? What does it have to do with deep learning? So far, nothing. <laughs> but now the deep learning part comes because for actually making this comparison of patient groups, you need to match patients because other than in a randomized trial, we're now looking at observational data and we need to control for something that's called selection bias. And the method to do that is so-called propensity score where a propensity score is actually defined as the conditional probability of assigning to a treatment condition given a set of observed covariates. And it's nicely depicted on the right side. So we see a population with different characteristics. And then basically after matching, you see, ah, this is now really comparable groups. You can now really do your analysis on. However, to do this matching on in the past, we did it on few observed covariates. So typically we only had access to, let's say, age, gender, few other things. So that's what we matched on. Now with having access to something like flat iron, where we have access to a lot of information on the patients, we need to be a little smarter. And that's research we are doing. So we are basically here looking into using autoencoders, which are artificial neural networks for unsupervised learning. And the purpose of these autoencoders is really dimensionality reduction in a nonlinear way. So it's quite similar to PCA, but a nonlinear extension. And you see it also on, in the picture with the mushroom. So you start off with the original mushroom. You do some, <clears throat> you should do some encoding. You have then a compressed data layer at some point. Then you can actually do the decoding, look at the learned representation. And if that's quite good, then you can say, oh, my compressed data layer can be kind of used. That's exactly what we do. So we take the data in flat iron, <clears throat> we train an autoencoder, yeah. So we end up with this trained embedding, and then we use this embedding now to compute the propensity score rather than using this manual selection approach. And just to show you some early results here, basically the autoencoder uh, approach outperforms state-of-the-art variable selection for the propensity score matching, which we see here. So actually, you can look at the p-value or the d-statistic. Um, and this was now proven on simulated data sets, but also in a real example. And it's quite exciting because uh, working toward this external control arm is really something where that will, I think, change um, the way we work yeah. quite a bit. So to summarize this piece, real-world data is really a super valuable resource of information about patients, their diseases, treatments, outcome in a not controlled setting. It already contributes to many decision points in our R&D value chain. For this particular example of external control arm, you need to really do proper patient matching <clears throat> and autoencoders based propensity score matching might uh, be a way to move forward uh, in the future. Yes, now I think I have. Yeah, so now we'll, hand, now we'll open up uh, for some questions and um, while Angelic is presenting, we'd like you guys to send in your questions. Um, so yeah, so over to so you, So now I'll take over. Um, so first of all, it's, it's very nice for me to be here and uh, I want to already thank my colleagues here for the wonderful content that has, has been shared. So before we go into the Q&A session, I just would like to take the next couple of minutes to, um, to show you how you can pursue a career in Roche if you are interested in that. So here you can see that you can ask the talent scout. Now, I guess my uh, face will be very well recognized after the, <laughs> the webcast. So I am a talent scout uh, in Roche, a talent scout for what we call digital talents. So as you know, um, uh, as you have heard, digital transformation in Roche is a reality and we have just uh, heard how these digital technologies are impacting uh, the world of healthcare. So 
for us in Roche, um, it is crucial that we connect with people like you. And for this, we have a, a global community of talent scouts. Um, here you can see in this slide represented, represented only um, a few of the regions where we are present in the world. And the regions are ranging from San Francisco to Mannheim in Germany, where I am located, where I'm based to our uh, headquarter here in Basel, where we are sitting today. Um, so this is a great way for us to connect to the tech global co communities globally. And um, another interesting aspect in Rush is that um, our internal tech communities are actually very, very active and, and proactive. And so they have created, for example, in Germany, the data science community. And um, it, it's a very interesting platform. So the, the, our tech people in Germany organize meetups where they share knowledge about specific technologies or bar camps where they come up with, uh, you know, with the, some topics in the morning and then they develop some new ideas. Um, so that's a very interesting place to be. Um, and at the global scale, we have the Rush Advanced Analytics Network, which is a similar community, but global. We also have other, uh, other communities, tech communities within Rush. So we are very, very uh, active from this point of view. And uh, we talent scouts, we are very much connected to these networks and we facilitate them to connect to the external world uh, like we are doing today. <clears throat> uh, so why talent scouts? Because we do believe in powerful connections. So um, we really want to, we don't want to connect with, uh, with what we call talents or tech professionals um, like you only when we have an open vacancy. But we want to connect to uh, eventually really uh, create these new collaborations that are very important to generate new ideas and stay present in the scenes and foster innovation. So for us, diversity is really a value that we share, that we cherish. And this is what we try to do also with the tech communities in Russia. We really want to work together, collaborate, share our knowledge and passion and uh, create new possibilities to shape the new future in, in healthcare. And in this sense, um, you can also play a very important role. So this is me. Uh, here you can find my contact details. Um, I am based in, in Germany, um, supporting Roche Diagnostics, but I am uh, connecting, like I'm really part of a global network. Uh, so please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, send me messages if you have any questions and follow me in social medias because um, myself and Kieran, we are very active and we share all the activities that are going on and, there, and that are organized by, by Roche. So Code for Life, it's a great initiative as Kieran explained at the very beginning. So this is the website. So go and visit uh, the page codeforlife.roche.com. This is also a great platform for you, not only to get to know how we use certain technologies to solve certain challenges in the healthcare, but also to, um, for example, if you are not familiar with the healthcare industry, you can uh, look at your uh, you know, technology competencies and skills and then find um, what career opportunities we have in Roche for people with your kind of background. So it's, uh, it's a very interesting page. Uh, so I would invite you to just have a look at that. Um, if you are also interested to, just curious to know about what other career opportunities are there in Roche, you can always visit our uh, Roche Careers webpage and just select, maybe you can use some keywords, select location, function, job level, and then you can find the job opportunities, including the ones that Florian <laughs> showed previously. <clears throat> and before we proceed with the Q&A session, um, this is just to uh, invite you once again to follow up in social medias because we are organizing an amazing uh, event, the Future X Healthcare 2019. This is going to take place uh, on, in Munich on the 14th of um, November. So more to come here. This is, of course, a, a very big event that is targeting uh, let's say talents from the academia, from the scientific world and technology world. So it could be very much interesting to you, but we will share more content about this later on. 
So thank you so much for, for being here. And now we open the floor to the Q&A session. Cool. So, I mean, we've received uh, three questions from uh, the webcast so far. Um, so I'll open up to whoever wants to answer it. So um, does the increase of the amount of data improve the accuracy and precision? So I guess maybe I'll start with a very trivial thing. It depends, of course. Uh, we did highlight about uh, the quality of data. So, of course, uh, additional high-quality data that's well annotated and well, uh, well positioned for the model, of course, will help. But maybe uh, experts here would think about examples where you've incorporated additional data. I think, I mean, sometimes one also has to say this, that with big data, there comes only the opportunity or the possibility to actually get this type of information. I mean, that's, I mean, I think one critical thing of this digital, um, that you get a lot of data and then that you can actually can start to query that data, which you couldn't really do before. And there are a lot of examples for that. Um, all in all, I totally agree with Bryn. Um, I mean, there's not a particular reason why you should expect that the precision is getting higher just because you speak about big data. If you are really, really well organized and have a great um, design of your study or your data set, then there's no reason to assume why you shouldn't get as precise data from a smaller data set. It's just, I mean, sometimes it is not available in that way and it might be easier to get the big data and then sift out the information you want to have. Yeah, I mean, maybe just to add, I think the quality is really what is so important. And I think uh, only big is not, not solving the issue. So we really have to think about quality. But also we, we have seen actually many cases when you look for certain pa patient population, even if you start very, very big, and you're gonna, you're gonna go in and, and have more search criteria actually apply, you might even end up in the end with very little data. So actually to start with big data is also good, right? Because at least there's hope you find and maybe the few patients that you can then work with. So maybe we didn't say, Anna did actually, in the, but we didn't highlight it, to train some of these uh, deep networks, for example, for image analysis classification, we're talking probably tens of thousands of images mm. of that scale. So if you were just curious, you know, what kind of scale of, Im mm. of these types yeah. of data, we're talking somewhere like tens of thousands of images. Mm. And uh, but what might be interesting is you, you may extend your model with additional data. So if you have, you know, we talked about veracity and variety in the four Vs of big data. So if you start with a data set that is somehow um, really a subset of the total. So it's a specific population of patients, for example, but you want a model that actually can uh, can extrapolate further than the boundaries of your data set, mm -hmm. then adding probably uh, new data sets that are outside the original population could be of great value as well to extend your model's applicability. I mean, this, I think you kind of almost answered this question by the previous one, but um, isn't it uh, true that small data techniques using traditional statistical methods can lead to more improved healthcare outcomes than big data methods? It depends. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it really depends. As you saw, traditionally you use propensity score matching to do something on few covariates. But, and that's a great method actually to do and it's quite established and there's a lot of publications out there you can read about it. But I mean now, one of the reasons is because no one had access to more than just a few covariates. Now that we do have more, we should at least look into these more, let's say, big data technologies like deep learning and see if it improves. It might, it might not. I think for many cases it's not really known and you have to actually try out. I think for imaging, for example, image analysis, I think it's pretty clear that deep learning is a good choice <laughs> in most cases. Um, and for other data sources, I think it's still research ongoing. Mm. Um, and maybe, yeah. maybe just to mention dimensionality. So as you saw in Anna's example, there was a, a dimensional reduction uh, approach taken. I guess the higher the dimensionality, so the more information that's encoded within a data set, the more difficult, I guess, it is to do with traditional techniques. It's not impossible, of course. You don't necessarily have to use deep learning, for example but it may be a more pragmatic uh, step to get to an outcome that you want. So um, have the panel worked with any uh, particular strategies to protect the data that they are that you guys are collecting? Maybe 
because we collect a lot of novel data now with the digital biomarkers. So, maybe for it. <clears throat> so I think data privacy and data security are key aspects. I mean, not only for digital biomarker data, but I mean, of course, about digital biomarker data, we collect data from the life of the patient. And um, so, of course, I mean, everything for us, everything starts on the smartphone. So the, at the moment, the data is generated, we encrypt it. Um, so and, and and thereby make it secure and um, then send it in secure ways to our servers. In our environment here in the Roche um, environment, of course, everything is also access restricted um, in the way that we um, adhere to all the regulations, but also going beyond that to um, ensure that data privacy and data security is really adhered to. And, I, um, and, and that's basically one thing which here in Roche is uh, one, one very big and important topic to ensure actually that this is really um, a tier two and every one of us feels, we, feels really also, I think a very personal interest in that is, that, that is actually happening, um, especially if you hear the news about that not being happening in the outside world so much, where my, maybe similar data becomes available just by chance over websites or whatsoever. So. Yeah, I think we, we obviously we have a strong values position in Roche about integrity and, and, and so on. So that is in the, the DNA of the company. But we also recognize trust is critical to, to the success of this whole endeavor. The trust between patients and ourselves, between healthcare professionals, patients and ourselves and that whole ecosystem. And as soon as you have examples, as Florian said, there's been some in the news over the years with different um, organizations. This really damages trust and sets back the whole uh, sort of progress of, of healthcare improvement. So we're very conscious to, to put trust first and foremost. Um, but for those maybe on the call who are less familiar with how do we do that, um, and maybe we could talk about pseudonymization as an example of how we make sure people can not see or not connect back to personal information. I mean, Anna, maybe you mentioned that. Yeah, I mentioned it because the flat iron data is actually pseudonymized which means that basically we, we here in Roche, we're not able to identify patients, but because, of, because this data, for example, might be very interesting if we find patients that fit to our, our trial and we want to recruit them, and that's actually something that a patient might be very much interested in, we can always go back to Flatiron and they can ask the patients whether they are interested, for example. And that's something I think is very nice because I don't need to know anything about these patients because I want to study other things like over the many patients, basically. Um, but there is this possibility, and I think this nice. Maybe one more thing also to add there, I think, is uh, there are nowadays nice ways of where, how we can actually bring our analytics to the data. So in many cases, it's not even needed that we really have access to the data, but we kind of develop our algorithms, we send them there. Genomics England is a great example where we do it this way, and I think that's also another way how we deal with these topics. And that's actually a perfect framing for the next question that's just coming. <laughs> um, so looking at, um, you know, having patients at the forefront of our minds uh, every day that we, when we come to work, how are we partnering with other pharma companies, uh, be it in mm. data sharing or in analytics? So what, what are we doing there to really help the patient? Mm. I start. So we, we actually touched a couple of examples, although we didn't mm. highlight this. So. Couple. So the Pistoia Alliance I mentioned right at the beginning, this is a collaboration between multiple pharma companies, academic groups, publishers, um, uh, software vendors in the scientific uh, sort of IT space. And there we run collaborative projects where we, we share data, but we also do joint coding projects. Um, and the idea, the whole um, ethos is to reduce the barriers to innovation in healthcare. So, you know, we realize there are many things we would like to do that we can't do alone. We don't have enough data, we don't have the time, and we don't have necessarily all the skills. So that's a big collaborative effort. And everything we produce there is open sourced, so it can be exploited, if you like, by the whole community. And the other example, again, that we passed over a couple of times was the uh, Systems Approaches to Biomedical Sciences Doctoral Training Center at Oxford, where actually we're now around about 20 companies, um, small and large companies, collaborating with the university and often we run projects jointly between several companies. And uh, again, it's all open source, um, pre-competitive collaboration. So the code is available, published. Uh, two examples. There are other examples as well. I don't want to highlight any. 
Yeah. I mean, DDIM, yeah. I, I think the IMI initiatives yeah. are another great example. So, where they use basically sponsoring these kind of pre competitive collaborations, and mm -hmm. Russia is an important player in there. I mean, just last week I was on a workshop basically about disease progression modeling. So, that's methods mm -hmm. and autoencoders and all the mm -hmm. fancy stuff was part of that. Um, where it's about in Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease using basically all the data that is available and collect, I mean, using other IMEI projects which actually enable the collection and annotation of this type of data and then building upon this um, pre-collaborative or pre-competitive data sets collected over the world and leveraging then new type of methods, developing jointly new type of methods to actually then enable to follow disease progressions with digital data and digitally collected data, but maybe also with um, traditional biomarker data. So there's not a difference there, and Russia is interested in all, of course. And for those who aren't familiar with IMI, it's the Innovative Medicines Initiative, um, and it's a collaboration between the pharma industry and the European Commission, and many other uh, collaborators. So I just have two more, two more questions. So this one is a double question. So, um, what are the biggest challenges to consider when analyzing image data? And what kind of imaging techniques have you, you all worked with uh, so far? Okay, we can't ask back, right? <laughs> 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 what is the big and cha biggest challenge? I think for some examples, still the biggest challenge is the labels, that you don't really have labels or not enough labels, right? I think that's for many examples actually the challenge. And where for the digital biomarker, I think it's often quite easy to generate data yourself because from healthy controls, you can basically just ask many people, oh, run around. For imaging data, especially if you think biopsy images, nah, can't be done. So you basically have to live with the data you have. And yeah, so this is, I guess, some of the challenges. I think this class imbalance problem is one yeah. of the biggest challenges because, I mean, in contrast to Google problems with image recognition, um, we have this, I mean, for us it's tailor-made questions. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah. um, like Anna said, I mean, it's maybe specific um, stainings in specific biopsies or yeah. um, other examples. And so to home into that type of territory, um, you have a lot of negative examples and very few positive examples and finding your way around that and actually ensuring that that um, you know, you're not overfitting that that you're actually finding the right type of information like leveraging what what Rince, um showed where you back propagate to actually understand where where the information is coming from is key mm -hmm. and um, i think that's also where again academia is key because they need to invest the time the PhD students to develop these type of methods even further so that we all mm. can leverage it and understand what is coming out there. Mm. I think from clinical images, uh, we mentioned, for example, retinal scans, uh, mm -hmm. and Anna mentioned biopsy images, which we work a lot with in uh, for tumor biopsy uh, images. You know, one of the biggest things is back to this data quality. So you would think in a clinical trial, you would get super high quality data, you know, well, as you say, well labeled, well annotated, curated. But even there, we, we struggle with data quality quite often. So I think having large scale, high quality data, again, it's, it's the same problem as many other big data challenges. Um, so the final question, um, we'll reply to other questions that you guys have answered by email, um, just in terms of timing, keep it, keep it uh, to the agenda. Um, what do you think will be the next big challenges um, in, in the field of healthcare and pharma? Um, perhaps they've not come up. Um, and how can we, how do you foresee using uh, big data and uh, deep learning to really solve these challenges? Mm. It's a very futuristic <laughs> it's a <huge> question. <laughs> okay. Maybe I'll, this is something, you know, we talk a lot about in different boards and things that we, we look at strategy of the future. And first of all, looking at the environment, what's going on in the world over the next 10 or 20 years. So we look at things, big mega trends, global warming, climate change, shifting populations, migration patterns and things and so at least many people predict there's going to be a change in uh, inf infectious diseases for example so more tropical diseases entering temperate climates more rapid spread of disease uh, we know about antibiotic resistance 
So this is a big area also Roche is very engaged with, with as well as other companies. So that's a trend. I think uh, a technical trend is uh, more towards therapies which target directly the, the genome. So uh, at the moment we have uh, molecules entering the clinic and even uh, getting to patients now which are gene therapy and uh, gene editing. Everyone hears about CRISPR-Cas9 and all the different variants that are going on. In time, we'll be able to edit the genome more precisely so we can probably cure and correct, for example, uh, monogenic rare diseases, and possibly even uh, significant risk factor uh, gene or gene variants that exist. Mm -hmm. So I think these are some of the trends that we're certainly mm -hmm. thinking about. Mm -hmm. How does that relate to AI and big data? Well, it's in the end all about getting the data and the models to, to, to drive that kind of uh, R&D. Mm -hmm. yeah, I also think, I mean, one of the challenges for us is, I mean, the development of a drug still takes time and the process is an established process with, which needs time and the disease also needs to develop in some way to um, actually show that the drug is working or not. And this goes into in contrast to many of the technical innovations which are now constantly popping up in Europe and in the US and China, basically, where different ways of analyzing data, where different ways of measuring things are coming up Via, via startups and whatsoever, and and to bring these both timelines together and make it actually happen, so leverage the best of both worlds. I think that's that's, that's one and, and in a regulated way because I mean this is I mean we have to adhere to the privacy of the data. We have to use proper statistical ways to actually mm -hmm. do our work there and align that to all the in what innovation coming everywhere. Um, I think that's that's also a key challenge how to how to optimize on this on, on these two timelines basically. So um, there, there was one question maybe around to Angelica. So okay. um, when looking at the field of hiring for digital talents, um, how are we looking at it from <coughs> skills and people who are really working at home, um, you know, doing this as a hobby, um, how are we actually hiring these these people? How are we identifying these people? So I mean we can speak around the Code for Life challenge, mm -hmm. but how is mm -hmm. the talent scout? How does this help uh, your daily work uh, to actually find these people? How do we find these people? That's that's my biggest challenge for, <laughs> that has been my biggest challenge last year and this year. So um, I think for me, uh, the, the best approach has been to uh, connect initially to the tech people in Roche, because we do have um, people like you guys in in house, and um, and then get to know these people, understand um, you know what do they like, what they don't like, what do they expect from uh, from Rosh, um, how did they learn about their skills, uh, where are they in their free times, you know. So this helped me to um, understand where to target uh, these talent networks, as we say. So now, of course, we are very busy at a, a global scale to um, organize, you know, events like this. It can be virtual or live to really come to, to you guys and connect with you and then, uh, uh, you know, start potentially a collaboration together. So I think having, um, I'm, I'm not sure if this was also a part of the question, having background in healthcare. I guess it is important, uh, but not for all the business groups that we have in Roche. So as you know, you might have, you know, checked the website. Roche is a very large organization. We have uh, different entities and they are very different from each other. So we do have also uh, eventually positions uh, where a background in science um, might not be needed. But of course, for the majority, as you know, we are in this field, uh, we are in, in, uh, experts in science, so uh, I think it's uh, that counts. Um, but of course, every case is, um, is you know unique, so we are always open to connect with you guys, and if you have questions, I'm, I'm always happy to, to, to have a chat about it. Mm -hmm. So with that, I just want to thank everyone on the call and thank you very much to you guys for bringing these amazing insights and at the end of the day, really helping change lives, which is why we come to work, right? Yeah. Um, so thank you very, very much. And uh, I wish you all a wonderful morning or evening. 
Hi, I'm Kristen Pressner, and I'm the Global Head of Human Resources for Roche Diagnostics. You may know me from my TEDx talk on unconscious bias. To keep up to date in the ways that Roche is leveraging science and technology to make healthcare more personalized, be sure you subscribe to our channel, click the bell to get notifications, and if you like what you saw today, give us a thumbs up. Thanks for watching this video, and we'll see you next time.